these policies are performing. That would be really interesting, and, and I think that might be also the, the future of, of our work within the context of this recommendation. Kremlin already mentioned them in his presentation, 2015, 2018, 2021. We've issued country fact sheets, giving us an idea of where we are with those policies within the different member states. Um, it is a, a collaborative work, uh, mainly by the national focal points, because they are our pivotal element within the member states who are collecting the data, who is not always very easily available. They have to really reach out to other departments within their member states to be able to collect all the data as input for these indicators. WHO is a very appreciated partner also in this for us at the European Commission because they are, have been doing also very valuable work on bringing together and bringing also that methodology in place in terms of uh, collecting the data. Now, this slide gives you an overview of the table of um, the country fact sheet report of last year, of 2021, indicating the evolution also between 2015 and, 20 and 2021. And what we see is that there are two indicators who score relatively low in all member states. We see that for a number of indicators, there's a continuous increase. For a few others, there's a decrease, but it is stabilizing. So we have more or less 75% of the uh, indicators that are in place in the different member states. Our aim is, of course, to end up with 100%. That would be really the ideal world where we would have 100% in all the member states for the 23 indicators. Then we have our job done and then we can go home. But I think that will take quite some, some time still. That being said, um, I'll move on to the Healthy Lifestyle for All initiative. Kremlin also referred to it in his presentation. This is an initiative that we've launched uh, a year ago. September last year it was launched. It is the follow-up of the Tartu call. So maybe some of you are familiar with the Tartu call, which ran between 2017 and 2019. And it is about promoting a healthy lifestyle. The difference between the Tartu call and the current um, initiative is that we've broadened it. Uh, initially, when we were in the Tartu call, we had uh, our unit, our DG EAC, who was working on it, DG Agriculture, and our colleagues from GRC, so the Joint Research Center, and the colleagues from uh, Agriculture. Um, those were the domains that we got together within the Tartu call. We've now expanded it to many more domains. So colleagues from environment are involved, colleagues from, from um, uh, transport, all these uh, colleagues from, of course, uh, DG Sante, so the health uh, department are involved. And that is one of the big differences between this current initiative and the uh, previous initiative. Um, it is our commitment to promote a healthy lifestyle from the European Commission. Um, it is a, a very important commitment, I think. Um, and it is um, going across sectors. It's also something that was important in the recommendation I was talking about earlier. That's also going across sectors. So we need to make sure that it goes beyond physical activity and beyond sport. Um, and therefore, what we've done, and it's a two-year initiative, what we've done there is really reach out, as I've said, to all those different departments. And one of the indirect um, uh, results of it is that we now have regular contact with all these colleagues working in those different departments, and we are sitting around the table and also emphasizing the importance of physical activity and sport in their work. And they are also learning from us, uh, and we are also learning from their work. And that interaction between those different departments and between those different policy domains is very enriching and will help us undoubtedly also forward in terms of promoting a healthy lifestyle for Europeans. So two-year initiative, meaning that next year, uh, September, there will be a, a closure event and we will uh, finalize it. One of the centerpieces of this uh, initiative, um, which in essence is a communication uh, campaign, one of the um, elements, important elements, is a pledge board. So we invite organizations, member states, civil, or, uh, civil society organizations to pledge through a project that they have, that they will commit to this uh, initiative, helping them also to um, showcase their uh, projects, but it helps them also to um, somehow communicate on that via our platform of the pledge board. Um, up until now, we have 75 pledges uh, from all over uh, the organizations, among which also WHO, for which we thank you. <laughs> um, and it's, it's our aim to really have as much as possible by next year, um, in terms of also bringing together, remember what I've said, we coordinate, we try to bring together and network these people. So these people come also to our events, meet one another and learn from each other also in their projects. The initiative is built around three pillars. 
Um, so if you have a pledge, you can pledge within one pillar, two pillars, or even the three pillars. First pillar is about raising the awareness on healthy lifestyle. So projects that are related to communicating about a healthy lifestyle can um, sign in into that first pillar and pledge on that first pillar. Second pillar, a very important pillar, is the one that we uh, where we focus on easier access to physical activity and sport. We, we, we see that still uh, a huge number of people, our um, uh, target audience is, is having difficulties to access physical activity and sport. Projects who are focusing on that specific element are also uh, welcome and also, um, um, let's say, uh, can also pledge and can also come on through the uh, pledge board. And then the final point, the final pillar is teaming up, is a holistic approach, is if you demonstrate that indeed you're not only talking about physical activity and sport, but definitely also bringing nutrition, for example, bringing also a, a environmental aspects in your project, you can uh, pledge within that third pillar. Of course, we have projects who have all three pillars in, in their pledge. Uh, that is, without any doubt, also possible. Harmonized sports statistics in the EU. And, and these are like four completely maybe different things, but there are interlinkages between them. And I, I bring them to you because I think that they're all related to uh, uh, your work in HEPA and they're all uh, related to certain aspects in what you are doing. For the uh, sports statistics in the EU, we have been um, asked since quite a while by our stakeholders being member states, being federations, to provide a sound knowledge base that can be used also to see where we are at, uh, at the European Union, where we are, at which level are we in terms of physical activity, but also economical dimension. Remember the three pillars I was talking about? Also, those are, are quite important. We've uh, launched a project, there was a call last year. We started with it in spring. The idea is that we will um, support, we will be supported at level of the EU, but also the national, uh, the member states will also be supported by us in terms of um, looking into what is ready, already there. So that's important. It's about harmonizing existing methodologies. So we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We will have a good look at what's out there. There are numerous, n numerous surveys, questionnaires out there who are measuring things. Um, the initial focus was very strong uh, on the uh, economical dimension. The sports satellite accounts was really a key element and still is a key element in this project. But we've broadened it also to measuring uh, levels of physical activity and we've broadened it also to the social dimension. So we've set up a, a task force. I'll show you a little bit in, in the second slide. But the task force of experts, of approximately 30 experts, uh, some of whom are here also uh, today. Um, the task force has been divided also in, in three subgroups who will specifically deal with these elements, the economic dimension, the measurement of physical activity, and then also the social dimension. And each one of them will have to see to what extent they can harmonize the different monitoring systems that are out there uh, to eventually, hopefully, uh, come up with even maybe a European system that can be applicable for everybody. Once again, like my 100% later on, a dream, it would be great if we could reach it, but it probably will take quite some time to, to get there. It's a three-year project, so it runs until January 2025, meaning that we've um, we take the time to work on that because we realize that it's really a huge amount of work and it will be difficult. So that's why we, we really said, okay, we need to take enough time. And even now that we're setting up the agenda, we realize that maybe it should have been a five-year project. But nevertheless, uh, we are working towards 2025 to, and come up with uh, a harmonized, uh, harmonized methodologies in those different um, pillars. Um, not only important to say, um, because um, I'm from the uh, DG EAC, it is our executive agency who is the contracting authority. So they are managing it. And we are also in close uh, collaboration with our executive agency. They are the ones who are also managing, for example, Erasmus. So what we, what we uh, intend to do in the, in the future is even enhance even more the, our cooperation between the two of us. They are the ones who are now contracting this, um, this uh, project. Uh, they are managing it. We are from DG EAC and I myself are involved uh, in this board of steering group together with colleagues from Eurostat, which is also quite important. Eurostat will also play a very important role within this project because they have the expertise in terms of statistical work um, and they are really taking on board also this project. So that's also very promising also from our po uh, point of view that they uh, will bring in their expertise uh, very significantly. Now, the specific objectives for the project, as I've said, the task force, really important. We are looking into, via the project, offering specific uh, technical support also to the member states, but also for ourselves. 
which is clearly also important because we also need that, that's, that's without any doubt. On ad hoc questions from, for example, member states, we will also be able to provide some background information and also analysis on, on specific topics that they have, specific questions that they have uh, within the field of collecting data and sports statistics. And bottom line is really supporting the policy process. So it is the evidence-based policy that we really want to support with proper uh, methodologies by, by which we can really collect uh, these, these data. And then my dessert that I promised at the, at the beginning, Share Initiative. Um, Share Initiative is, um, was initiated following a study of 2016. So in 2016, we've um, um, had a study which, which looked at the role of sport within regional development. Because we knew from the gut feeling that a lot of sports stakeholders had found a way to the funds within regional development, within the cohesion policy. So the study demonstrated that our gut feeling was right. There were a lot of uh, sports-related, physical activity-related projects who tap into the uh, much bigger funds than the Erasmus Plus funds who are out there. So we created in 2018 this platform which would allow our stakeholders also to get acquainted and to learn about the potential of sport and physical activity as a contributor to the regional development. We are all convinced of it. So there are a lot of people out there who are not always thinking about physical activity and sport when they are setting up development plans for their regions, when they are setting up um, development plans even for, for their local communities. And the idea is that we try to somehow like guerrilla warriors go in there and demonstrate to them that we can contribute and that they can really have, uh, that we can bring an added value in what they are doing. The uh, platform, we gather together the sport movements, but also cities, regions, SMEs, academia, uh, research institutes, they're all invited to join our SHARE Alliance. So we have a SHARE Alliance, which is the big group who's interested in that and who can bring in some, uh, some, some uh, expertise. And we have a SHARE Lab, which is a smaller group of approximately 15 uh, organizations who work very closely together and who are preparing um, what we are uh, doing as tools. They help prepare us papers. So we have a number of policy papers, research papers, all dealing with that element of how can sport and physical activity contribute to that regional development. Um, we have a number of events that we set up, so uh, within a few weeks we will have a session at European Week of Regions and Cities, specifically on the green transition and green transition in and with sport clubs and how can they contribute with a number of presentations. Um, it will be an online event, uh, unfortunately. Um, online database. You, if you go to the website of the sport unit of uh, DG AIAC, you will see that there's the online database indicating, I think we have like 220 projects uh, all over Europe where you have sport and physical activity who is part of a project that has been funded by the uh, Regional Development Fund. Um, and of course, in terms of communication, there also what we try to do is issue uh, newsletters. So we will re-pick that, we will restart that again now in September. The project runs uh, for the time being up until June next year, but given the need and given the request from our stakeholders, this is definitely something that will uh, remain and it will stay. Um, just on a side uh, note, you need to be aware of the fact that um, sport has since 2009, since it has a legal base, the money and the funds that are available for sport are increasing, but with each, each uh, multi-annual financial framework, the funds available for sport are increasing. So now for the period 21-27, we have by, by, uh, approximately 500 million uh, within Erasmus Plus available for the uh, projects. Within the other funds, we're talking about trillions and billions. So, I mean, it is increasing for sport and physical activity, but if you compare it with what is available in the other funds, it, it, I dare to say that it's that's almost peanuts. So. That is why we need to open up also and look into those other funds, uh, regional development, also Horizon, also uh, the health uh, funds. There are up possibilities and what we do, the commitment that we uh, bring is that we try to, uh, I would say, internal, do the internal lobbying and make sure that physical activity and sport is not forgotten within those programs and that literally it is written down in the program, sport and physical activity. Very often it's about countering uh, physical inactivity we're also happy with that because then we know that we can step in and that we can have our stakeholders step in and get funds also from those different uh, funding possibilities. 
final slide on this, and it's really illustrative. At the center point, you have sport and physical activity. And what we have done is we have um, looked into all the fields and domains where sport and physical activity can be involved. So in the outer circle, you have like our five flagships. So the Green Deal, Connecting Europe, Europe for European citizens. The, uh, I would say, um, light blue bulbs are like the programs and the different elements that other colleagues in other departments outside of DGEAC are working with. You can see that there are a huge number of connections that can be made. And this is also for our stakeholders, this was also an eye-opener where they started realizing, okay, we have to look beyond sport and physical activity and see how we can fit in into all these different other fields. A very important uh, message in this context is partnerships. So um, very often I get the question, okay, we want to step into this, we want to get European funds. It's essential that you work on your partnerships and that you work together. Um, keep in mind that it's almost always about co-financing. So those partnerships are really important and you really need to invest in that. If you're a first timer, try to hook your wagon on to partners who have more experience, really important, um, and start small. <laughs> uh, very often it's, it's better to, to have a, a, a smaller project to start with, learn how it works, and then gradually on the long term make sure that you come up with projects that can get uh, bigger funding um, over the years and, 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 and in the future. So that's it, that was the dessert. Um, I invite you to keep in touch with us, we're online. Um, I'm still here today and tomorrow. So if you want to uh, talk to me, no problem. You can, you can ask me whatever you want, um, really. <laughs> um, and besides that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Are we, do we have time? No. Any questions? Please. Hello. Um, I'm Vasiliki Kolo from the UK. Um, my research looked at cross-sector partners and their experiences of working together for physical activity. So as you said, it's quite important, I agree, to engage all sectors not just uh, physical activity and sport. My question is about funding. A barrier that usually is reported is, is about funding um, systems and how things are funded so that it creates a little bit of an imbalance between partners so that one partner maybe gets the funding and then they have to split it amongst them, creating a little bit of a tension sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can overcome that with how funding is distributed and help kind of that balance and fairness among the partners. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question and, and it's a good question and it's uh, from our experience as I've said we have the Erasmus Plus project where we have uh, each year at the end of January our uh, Sport Info Day where we invite our stakeholders to Brussels where the explanation is being given on how the uh, project runs and what it is, how you, what the objectives are and how you have to apply. And one of the things that there is, is clearly indicated also is the relationship between the partners and how, that you, how you can set up. So we do uh, organize these sort of, I would call them capacity building, uh, in terms of learning how to work together. And that's why I've said also that it's crucial and very important that you um, have a long-term vision also and start partnering up um, of course, I mean, if you're al already experienced, uh, you, you know which are good partners and which aren't, aren't such a good partners. And it's, it's, it's like in a relationship, a personal relationship also. You need to learn one another, you need to get together, you need to see what the intentions are of that partner. And I think it's also important that from the start on, you have uh, a good uh, partnership uh, document and that you write out really clearly who will be responsible for what and which funds, which parts of the funds will be connected to it. I can only talk for Erasmus Plus because that's something that we follow up actively. So I'm not aware of how it goes in the other departments and how they are organizing themselves. So for Erasmus Plus, there we are really uh, um, investing time and energy in terms of learning how to work together and partner, partner up with one another. And, and that is why the Info Day is, is what, why we organize it and why it's so important. But um, um, I think my advice would be make sure that you go in, 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 in a partnership with people you know already 
that you can trust and that you have really written uh, a written uh, agreement with the different partners who will be responsible for what and how the funds that will you will receive how they will be divided um, I, I think that is that is essentially uh, what you have to uh, look into but I, I can imagine that for example in, in different programs um, it's always also about looking good into the objectives of the programs and how it's described there because usually also in the calls um, you can you can see in the call documents uh, descriptions also of how the partnership should be set up and who would be responsible for what very often you have a lead partner and then uh, other partners who are in, uh, in, in in the project and there also I think it's important that internally you come up with an agreement among yourselves and see who is responsible for what I hope that answers more or less your question yeah can I add a little bit about the funding <laughs> bit? Sorry, it will be very quick. Um, would that be funding for the evaluation bit attached to it, or is it just funding for running the activities and interventions? And evaluation is up to the partners. Well, once again, I go back to Erasmus Plus. Within Erasmus Plus pro projects, evaluation is also included in the whole package of the uh, of the uh, um, of the the funding. So, so in that case, there also we expect also from the uh, applicants that at the end of the projects there is also an evaluation. Very often it's with a closing event where then they present the uh, results and very often also with deliverables that come out uh, with the results and the conclusions of the project. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Michael. That's definitely a cheap talk for me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, I'd just like to thank Kremlin and uh, the WHO Regional Office in Europe for inviting headquarters to give a little bit of an insight on the global picture, maybe. You know, I appreciate you've got a European focus, but we thought it might be helpful just to get an idea of some of the other work that's happening at the global level. So, um, oh yeah, my first slide is up. My name is Juana Willemsen. I'm a technical officer in the Physical Activity Unit in Geneva. We're a new unit. We're only about two years old, but I think that does reflect some of the changes that there have been within the organization and the particular focus now given to physical activity. In a sense, we've been recognized. Uh, we've been separated out from just being underneath NCDs, and we're now within a Department of Health Promotion and, and have that support to really work on the implementation of the Global Action Plan that was published in 2018. So my intention today is just to really give you a very brief overview of some of the work that we are doing at a global level. And it, it does recognize that this region has an enormous amount of capacity, both within our regional office and within the people sitting in this room and your network that you have. And that is not the case for many of the other regions around the world. And so our role at headquarters is really one of developing norms and standards very boring sometimes documents and uh, support to policymakers, and giving additional technical support and technical assistance to countries and regions where that capacity maybe isn't there. Many of our regional offices might have a quarter of a person that's working on physical activity. And certainly down at the country level, we're looking at an tenth of a person. So um, we, we need to provide that backup and that support. I won't remind you all about the Global Action Plan. I'm sure everybody's very aware of it. This nice little spaghetti diagram uh, really just reminds us of the four different areas of work and the recommendations that are there as part of the Global Action Plan. And as we work to help countries implement uh, recommendations across those four areas, we keep that very much in mind as a, as a sort of framework for us moving forward. A lot of our work is developing guidance, tools, norms and standards uh, that are there to help countries, help their decision makers make decisions and prioritize policies, make decisions about prioritizing where they put their spending and their funding. And, and then help with some of their practical advice on how that might be achieved. And again, you know, we're, we're putting our global hat on and thinking about those low, low middle income countries that where capacity may be less, resources may be limited, 
and the ability to bring stakeholders such as yourselves into a room to support decision makers may be limited. So leading on from the publication of the Global Action Plan, we, we worked to update the guidelines on physical activity from the 2010 recommendations. And we also developed new guidelines for an age group that had been missing before. This was children aged under five, and we've published the first guidelines, the first global guidelines on physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep for that particular age group. But as we all know, guidelines in themselves do not change behavior. And so a lot of our work is based on developing a set of modules that support the active technical package. And these modules really do provide practical information, how you might go about developing key policies and key settings and for key populations. And, and they focus on the, the key interventions, the key components that would be important for that population or that setting, how you would go about developing a policy and implementing it, and what are the enabling factors that will support that being put into place. And at the moment, we, we have four that have been published and many more that are in the pipeline. So to support the implementation of the guidelines for children under five, we've developed a set of standards and a toolkit on physical activity and healthy diet, recognizing that these two, particularly in this age group, are really intertwined for early childhood education and care settings. We also have a toolkit on promoting physical activity in schools, uh, one for brief counseling interventions in primary health care. And related to that, there's a um, part of the Be Active, uh, Be, Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative. There's Be Active, which is an SMS program to support people who are very sedentary to actually start doing some walking and take them up to about 10, 20 minutes walking uh, a day over a, I think it's an eight week program. So these are all very linked together and they have a real focus for, for low resource settings. The top red one at the top there is a um, toolkit on communications campaigns. So mass media communications campaigns on physical activity, which is under development at the moment. You may recall that this is one of the best buys for NCDs um, and some of you will have noticed that the best buys are currently being updated and there's a consultation period on at the moment. For the communications campaigns, we've already done an, a review of the evidence and we had some support from um, our collaborating centre in Sydney in reviewing that evidence. But also in looking at some of the campaigns that many countries around the world are doing or are certainly stating that they had done in the last couple of years, we see a great variety in terms of the quality of some of those campaigns and the elements that they contain. So we're currently developing a set of best practice criteria to really guide countries on what would be the, um, the important elements when developing, delivering, implementing, and then evaluating any communications campaign on physical activity. And this will be part of the process in developing the toolkit as well. So that toolkit's under development. We have a toolkit on walking and cycling, which will also come out shortly, I hope. And that's also linked with other work that we're doing to adapt the heat tool and to use that in low and middle income countries. It's, it's been done in Ghana. We're moving into Ethiopia in the next uh, few months and really supporting those countries and, and working on their walking and cycling policy. So for all these toolkits, and as I said, there are a number that are under development or in the pipeline, they're really based on evidence. They propose these key components, um, how you would develop and implement those, provide some case studies, and then enabling factors. And just because there may be interest in the room in terms of some of that evidence base that we use, Toolkits that are forthcoming are on older adults and promoting physical activity amongst them. We're also really interested in people living with disability, some of the barriers they face, how we can overcome those and how we can support them to be more physically active. Uh, and there's another toolkit on, oh gosh, it's absolutely gone on me, but I will remember it later and if anybody catches me over coffee, I'm sure it will come back to me. As I mentioned, the best buys are currently being updated. I, th 
think the second open consultation just closed a couple of days ago, but we're moving now into member state consultation on the 19th of September. And then the, the next piece that's really important for us this year is the launch of the first global status report on physical activity. That QR code is for the registration for the webinar that will be on the 19th of October. And this is the first global look at how countries are doing in terms of implementing those GAFA recommendations. Uh, we've used two main data sources, the NCD Country Capacity Survey, which has been running for several years. Every other year it goes out to Ministries of Health and we have 194 countries respond. We have a 100% response rate. And we've also looked at the road safety survey that was conducted in 2018 because we're particularly interested in some of those transport policies that support walking and cycling or don't support walking and cycling. And so these have been our two main data sources. And I think as, as is probably predictable, progress is a bit uneven and it's a bit slow. There haven't been quite the advances that we would have hoped. Many low and middle income countries aren't doing particularly well. And I think linking into what both of the previous speakers have said as well, sometimes we see policy on paper, but it's not funded and it's not implemented. And so we're, we're seeing quite a gap in terms of what's been reported and what's actually on the ground. So that, that report will come out. It will have the data on all the relevant physical activity indicators that we've been able to identify where we have a global survey with comparable data that we can present. And we're also going to develop some country cards uh, on each, each country's um, indicators. So I think that's probably all from me. Um, there is a lot of other work going on. There's a lot of other work going on in terms of some of the sports legacy work that we're, we're doing, bringing different um, stakeholders together uh, to, to really develop uh, a physical activity system uh, and bring, bring them together as, as a whole. There's work advancing, as I said, on these key populations. Uh, we've really prioritized older adults and people living with disability moving forward. And there's physical activity being implemented and inserted in different areas too within the organization. So later this month, there are guidelines on mental health in the workplace, which include recommendations on physical activity. And I know work is just starting on some guidance on for people living with dementia. So it, it really is going across the whole organization as well. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Sorry, yeah. Thank you so much. Abby King from Stanford University. That was wonderful in terms of seeing what you all are doing. Can you comment at all on any work looking at urban nature and physical activity and both health and the environment? We're not currently doing anything in that particular area. Um, I know we're trying to work quite closely with our colleagues in terms of environmental health, um, particularly for children. And our, our work on public open space has not probably advance quite at the speed we would have liked to uh, in terms of some of those, those different aspects. We are a relatively small unit, relatively small number of people working on this, so we do reach out a lot to others to support our work. Uh, and we, we work very closely with our collaborating centers, with academics and with, with others to, to really support that in order to advance those different areas. So that there are areas that are very much on the books to address, but um, getting to them bit by bit. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Right. Thank you, colleagues. So let me thank again uh, Michael Sonnius from the Sports Senate European Commission and Joanna Williamson from the headquarters for joining us, and to all of you for joining us early morning for this session. I'm sure they will be available during the coffee breaks and lunch to follow up questions. Thank you to all of you for joining us this session. Thank you. Very much.
everybody. I hope you're fine and that you're enjoying the conference. The talk of Audrey de Nazel is going to start very soon. So, I'm Fabienne Darry Plongville, the head of the scientific committee, and I'm very happy uh, to introduce the talk of Audrey today. So I met Audrey uh, a few years ago in London during uh, the ISPA conference in 2018, and she was uh, the chair of a very interesting symposium about physical activity and air pollution. And we talked together, shared some ideas, and we invited her for a talk um, in Nice in 2019 and uh, a, a collaboration began with Université Côte d'Azur and Imperial College of London, uh, notably through a PhD co-supervision between uh, Audrey and Anne with Utanum Singapore. Uh, so Audrey, it's really a great pleasure and uh, an honor to introduce your talk today. <laughs> So who is Audrey? Uh, Audrey de Nazel is a senior lecturer at the Center of, um, for Envir Environmental Policy at Imperial College of London. Her work at the inter intersection of environmental sciences, health behavior, transportation, and urban planning aims at guiding decision makers towards health promoting built environments and policies. Much of her research has been on the relationships between active travel and air pollution, and she's going to give a talk on this topic today, and much more, uh, with the case for system thinking in urban policies. So again, thank you very much, uh, Audrey, for being there, and I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Fabienne, and thank you, Anne, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to be here. I've been really enjoying the talk so far. I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, the, uh, today as well and tomorrow. And as for beautiful Nice, uh, I'm here with my family, and they get to enjoy it and have fun, so that's good for me, too. I get to live vicariously. So speaking of my family, I had a very long flight over from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we had lots of delayed flights. And so as a result, my kids really helped me out with those slides. So I hope you enjoy their, their inputs into those slides. Um, so I'm here uh, to talk about really trying to make the case for using systems thinking approaches in the way that we tackle physical inactivity, but also other major great uh, public health and uh, planetary health challenges, such as climate change and, phys and, and air pollution. So just so we're on the same page, what do I mean by uh, systems thinking? Yes, that's uh, input from my little seven-year-old son. <laughs> so um, what do I mean? So we're all on the same page. Systems thinking for, to me is really thinking about a problem as a whole, as an entire system, and understanding the interacting factors. And it's really so that we create uh, an evidence-based research that uh, analysis that helps us tackle real-world problems so that we understand not only feedback effects, uh, but also making sure that we reach our uh, intended outcomes, our desirable outcomes, and we prevent uh, unintended consequences. So why do I feel that we really need this? I think in many cases, uh, whether it's to tackle climate change or air pollution, major public health issues, we tend to have a very narrow-minded approach to reaching our target. So we set ourselves a target, uh, for example, uh, an air pollution standard, and we tend to be very siloed in the way that we think about it and the way we act upon it. And that, as a result, we ignore that there may be some other pathways to reach that target. And we ignore that there might be some beautiful, oh, that was supposed to be a rainbow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My daughter's gonna be very disappointed. Uh, so th we have beautiful uh, uh, co-benefits along the way that we could be reaching. And we uh, ultimately, those other pathways might be better at reaching the ultimate goal. We forget that sometimes those targets, 
that we set ourselves to uh, reach are in fact for a greater goal. Often that greater goal is public health and well-being, but we get very focused, for example, on just reaching that air pollution standard. So, and as in, in that narrow-minded and, and siloed thinking uh, approach, we, we sometimes even think about, forget about the fact that these, uh, these single-minded approaches might have some unintended consequences that we don't think about. So that to give you the general picture, but to make it a bit more concrete, how about climate change? So in the case of climate change, uh, in some cases, when we've gone a bit too far, we don't have many paths to take. So that poor fellow here doesn't really have much of a choice. But in most cases, uh, and particularly in urban environments, which is what I mostly work on, there are many pathways to reach climate change goals. And what do we do? Again, in our often very siloed thinking, narrow-minded approach, we often think of technological solutions as being what's gonna come and save us. So we sit back and relax and say, think, ah, it's okay. There's gonna be electric cars all over our cities pretty soon, we'll be fine. Well, that's the kind of vision then that we, uh, we see for our cities. That's the kind of future that we see as climate friendly. And I think that's a missed opportunity. In fact, once we've replaced every single one of those cars in our streets, with uh, another car but a different engine in it, will we seriously be much better off? Or can we do much better and think of completely redesigning our cities? So not only are we tackling climate change, not only are we tackling air pollution, but by the same token, we're creating a much better uh, environment for ourselves and creating much greater health and well-being. So that's what I wanna do today, is demonstrate the, the type of, of approaches and make the case for these type of very ambitious urban transitions. Now I understand they're not quite as easy and, and uh, politically feasible as technological solutions, but there's so many good reasons to reach out and to try to aim at having these types of urban transformations. And you'll think, well, of course, it's a no-brainer. It's obvious this is gonna be much better. Why is it not happening? So I've, I've put a lot of thought into understanding, trying to think why it is that we're not integrating these much more health promoting types of solutions to tackle uh, multiple uh, urban and societal problems. So with some colleagues, we reviewed the literature to try and understand what might be some of the barriers and enablers of integrating health in, uh, reach, uh, in targeting a climate change or air pollution so that we have a much more uh, comprehensive and, and ambitious way that's health promoting to tackle these issues. So we've put together, uh, we've tried to think about it and, and we've identified really three major areas. Of course, all of these are completely intertwined and interconnected, but basically we have institutional arrangements that lead to very siloed thinking. Departments and sectors tend to work in, uh, in their own separate ways. Our evidence base that many of us are, are uh, involved here, here in is often also siloed thinking. We, don't necessarily uh, embrace the complexity of the real world, the complexity of, under, of not only what are the multiple impacts of our policies, but also how we engage with policymakers and, and citizens. And we forget sometimes that ultimately it's political will, it's politicians who are gonna make that, these decisions. So we need to really think a lot more about, and I think that's something that Abby touched upon yesterday, understanding far better how you, you and convince policymakers and how you might engage citizens in providing the, the support for policies for these really much more important uh, transformations in our urban environments than their simple technological solutions to tackle some of the individual issues. So I'm gonna spend now the rest of the time uh, showing to you some of the evidence base that tries to tackle uh, in kind of the system as a whole, trying to uh, demonstrate the, the the benefit of having a systems approach, of having a more holistic thinking in, in urban developments when we tackle those major public health and planetary health problems. And as we go along, I'll point to some of the tools that we can be using and some of the thinking. Of course, it's, there's a lot more work to be done, so it, this is uh, in, in its infancy, but I think there's much more work. So I'm gonna uh, show you as we go along the way. So my first example, is the development of health impact assessments. So these could be tools that can be very uh, engaging. And I'm gonna show you some, an example of a health impact assessment that we did in, in London, 
where we looked at the strategies that were put in place uh, that were in the air pollution strategy in London. Uh, this is some work that I did with one of my uh, uh, PhD students, Andrea Calderon. And so we looked at the policies that were in their quality strategy, and we developed some that were slightly more ambitious as well. We compared the uh, solutions that were technological, and in fact, most solutions, as I've said before, were technological in the uh, air quality strategy. Uh, things like the electrification of the vehicle fleet, for example. And we compared these with the more behavioral solutions. So all the behavioral solutions had something to do with um, uh, getting people out of their cars and modal shifts towards walking, cycling, and public transportation. Some uh, not too ambitious, such as just increase uh, by 10% of the cycle path network, and some far more ambitious, like reduction of the um, car traffic and modal shifts for 50% of the cars. And we looked at the impacts in terms of mortality, number of deaths avoided. We looked at two different, and that's the x-axis here is, is the number of deaths avoided. We looked at uh, two pathways. One is uh, the impacts on health through the reduction of air pollution. Those are your, the blue boxes here of our NO2 and PM2.5. And we also looked at the physical activity benefits, and that's the yellow boxes. Ignore the green for now. So uh, what we found is that the modal shift uh, scenarios were uh, two to 15 times, had two to 15 times greater health benefits than the most ambitious uh, technological solution, which was electrifying the entire vehicle fleet in London. So what we see is clearly when we look at the big picture and when we think about our ultimate goal, which even when we address air pollution, our ultimate goal is not necessarily just reaching an air quality standard, but ultimately we want to promote health. So when we think a bit more broadly about how we want to reach our ultimate goal of promoting health, clearly the behavioral solutions are far more attractive than some of the technological, than all of the technological solutions that are in the books, in fact. So again, see, taking the big picture, stepping back, thinking in systems, here's here we, some evidence that shows that uh, we can do far better than just technological solutions. But of course, when we, uh, we, we uh, get people out of their cars into walking, cycling, public transportation, physical activity, air pollution are some of the benefits, but you can get, think of a lot, a lot more benefits than just that. So for example, if we're, we create some space, space uh, taken by, currently by cars, w in which we might be more usefully be putting trees, green space, playgrounds, areas that are safe for people to walk and bike. So to give you some more examples of uh, w some of those outcomes that we can quantify, here's some work that I did also with some of my uh, former students, where we looked at multiple type of impacts that can be quantified in terms of, uh, again, mortality um, uh, avoided. So number of deaths avoided, that's your x-axis in this case. And we looked at various types of pathways. These, uh, this is a scenario for a health impact assessment where we reduce 50% of car traffic and reduce it um, and replace it with walking, cycling, and public transportation. So here again, when it comes to physical activity, uh, walk, those are the walking and cycling health benefits uh, in terms of mortality avoided. Again, we have uh, air pollution benefits uh, from uh, getting people out of their cars, additionally some noise benefits that we were able to quantify, and here appears some green space uh, health benefits. So smaller than the other uh, impacts, but still you can see how just this is just exposures to, to green space that has a, a robust epidemiological analysis so we can quantify the health benefits of these types of, of urban transitions. So clearly you see here, if you were to uh, use technological solutions, all the physical activity and green space benefits would not, would not appear. And when you think about green space, there are multiple other types of benefits that are perhaps hard to quantify today, but are uh, nevertheless uh, can be quite engaging and are important for some sectors, things like um, biodiversity, uh, stormwater management, uh, the, um, the space for uh, urban gardening, for example. So all of these other types of benefits, which perhaps are harder today with the current epidemiology, current understanding, hard to quantify in robust ways with number of deaths avoided, which is kind of an easy, clear-cut way to express benefits. But there's some that are benefits that might be less tangible, uh, harder to, to quantify, but yet ca uh, can be just as important in terms of engagement. And remember I said a bit earlier, important thing is not just to 
uh, to demonstrate uh, the, the evidence in terms of impacts, but it's also figuring out ways to engage the public the stakeholders so that we can be far better at pushing for new policies. So I think it's important for us to be thinking about the type of hooks, uh, not only the types of uh, outcomes that might engage different sectors, so we can create alliances across different sectors, but al also think about what might be engaging to members of the public so that we can rally forces behind a, a common vision so that we can put pressure on our politicians. So I'm just going to show a few examples of some studies that uh, have outcomes that are perhaps, again, not quite as robust or tangible or easy to communicate, but that might be just as important in terms of engagement. So an example is uh, stress. I think uh, we often think of uh, urban living as being associated with stress, epitomizes pretty much uh, uh, life in urban environments. And many of us are more and more concerned about how we might address uh, stress, not only is it a public health issue, quality of life issue, and I think many of us would like to figure out ways to relax and be less stressed in our lives. So in this uh, study, it's a part of a European project called PASTA, we looked at the stress impacts of different uh, transport choices. And uh, in this case, we had uh, some measured uh, stress through galvanic skin response. And we saw that for people who cycled, uh, their time they spent in cycling activities reduced their amount of stress by 11% in a statistically significant way. For people who walk, walking reduced reduce stress by 5%, again, statistically significant. Now, in motorized transport, people had just a tiny increase, just a 1% increase in stress, but it is statistically significant. So we can see how engaging people in active travel modes might uh, be something that would reduce stress and might be an engaging uh, aspect of, um, for, for people to look forward to. And, and, lo and, and bear in mind that these, uh, that these analysis were done with the current state of the environment in European cities. This is data collected in three European cities. London, Barcelona, and Antwerp, currently rather stressful for walking and cycling, and yet we're still finding some uh, clear-cut uh, impacts of, um, of uh, uh, active travel and reducing stress. So again, something that might be engaging to citizens. Uh, in the same PASTA study, we did some questionnaires in seven different cities where we uh, asked people uh, their self-perceived self uh, outcomes like mental health and vitality. What we found is that for people who biked, the more they biked, the more they, re they improve their mental health. This was statistically significant for any of the other uh, travel modes. Biking and walking increased the sense of vitality, statistically significant increases. None of these other outcomes were statistically significant for other modes. We also asked about loneliness and contact with friends and family. Cyclists, the more they cycled, the more they reduced their levels of loneliness, although we also found some benefits of motorized transport for loneliness. And people who walked, the more they walked, the more they uh, increased their interactions with uh, friends and family in a statistically significant way. None of the other modes had those statistical associations. So here again, we see that those are, th uh, are the types of outcomes that might be engaging both for, for public health uh, point of view, but also for uh, for citizens, members of the public, who might be uh, probably not looking at those tables, but they might re-engage uh, with these kinds of outcomes. Something that uh, many of us uh, uh, would like to know probably, for those of us who struggle with our weight, uh, again in the same PASTA study, we looked at body mass index in different travel modes, and we saw that for people who biked, the more they biked, the more they had lower uh, body mass index, again, statistically significant, while there's people who drove, the more they drove, uh, the higher their, their body mass index. In fact, on average, we found uh, a four kilogram difference between the average driver and the average cyclist. This is from a, a static point of view, but we also had longitudinal data, and so we were able to see that for people who biked, if they increased their levels of cycling, they had a reduction in their bo body mass index, again, statistically significant, and people who were uh, frequent cyclists and remained fr frequent cyclists without increasing but stable frequent cyclists, again, they, they reduced their body mass index, which wasn't the case for any of the other situations, which is uh, very occasional cyclists or non-cyclists at all. So again, something that uh, uh, might not be the most prominent uh, public health concern, as in the, the impacts are might, might not be gigantic, 
although at the population level, of course, it's important. But it's also something that you might engage people, to how people might be surprised at how much they can actually uh, reduce their body mass index by, s by sim simply going uh, uh, on walking or cycling as their means of, of transportation. Some things uh, perhaps are difficult to convey with graphs and numbers, and maybe an image will do far better. And so thinking about how we might engage uh, members of the public, citizens, towards a vision of what our, our cities could look like. So this is a, a Fleet Street in London, a street that's currently full of, of traffic. This is what it could look like. Can this help us bring people behind us and say, look, you know, this, we can live in this environment if, if that's all what we want and we desire and we push for. So maybe communicating on how that future vision might be is, might be the best way to go about. Now, I mentioned earlier that, um, uh, that we need to consider unintended consequences. And of course, uh, that's a part of the systems uh, approach, definitely need to be considering that. Now, unintended consequences of active travel, this is something that many people uh, uh, seem to be concerned about. And I've done a lot of research trying to understand the trade-offs between uh, walking, cycling, uh, air pollution, and physical activity benefits and unintended consequences. So this is just one example of a modeling study I did in Barcelona, where we uh, looked at modal shifts of 50%, no, that was 40% of uh, modal shifts from uh, driving to walking and cycling. And you see in the, the green and blue colors there are the benefits from air pollution and physical activity. And in the, the, the small red and orange, uh, is the, the risks associated, the risks associated with increased traffic mortality and increased uh, inhalation of air pollution. And this is one of the earlier studies, but there have been lots of repeated studies uh, since then. And in general, we find very overwhelming evidence that the benefits of active travel by far outweigh uh, the risks. And I'm happy to have a lot more discussion about this um, at the end, if you wish. Now, one unintended consequence, which I think is far more complex to deal with, is, of course, when we create those uh, active travel-friendly environments, we really beautify our neighborhoods, beautify our cities. And in itself, that sounds like very, it might be very appealing, but it might also have unintended consequences, in particular of gentr gentrification, social exclusion. People might feel that uh, because of price increase, they might be uh, excluded from their neighborhoods, and that's something that we really need to deal with and, and, and think about in a much more complex way. But we also have an unintended consequences of, of uh, um, technological solutions. So think about electric vehicles. If any of you have seen any of the, the, the photographs or research that show the uh, conditions of people who go out mining for cobalt, uh, that's the necessary to build the um, batteries in, in vehicles, it's absolutely horrendous. And it's enough uh, to put you off uh, electric vehicles for the rest of your life, I, I believe. Uh, so th that's an, an unintended consequence. But one, we, one unintended consequence is we really don't talk about much at all, which I think is absolutely essential, is that when we create the kind of environment, uh, when we invest into infrastructure, we invest into a system uh, of, for example, electrifying the vehicle fleet, we don't realize not only is it an opportunity cost, we could be investing in something else, but even worse, it's we get uh, locked in into a system. So we've created invest the infrastructure and the vested interest. It's very difficult to extricate ourselves from that if we decide to change course. So that we saw that with, um, with diesel vehicles. Uh, we created the vested interest and infrastructure. Uh, diesel vehicles were promoted because it they were seen as better to for climate change. Once we realized, of course, we knew all along, but once uh, the, uh, realized more forcefully, I guess, that, that it was, they were worse for health, it's been really hard to get out of it. So again, thinking a bit beyond uh, what our, our very nearby targets might be, no matter how important they are, and I, I, I can't deny that electric vehicles are definitely part of the solution, but we really need to be thinking about, is that really what we want for the future of, of our cities, knowing that we will be creating a, uh, a lock-in into a system. So to wrap things up, um, I think I've shown that there are multiple types of benefits from urban tra transitions uh, that will promote not only active travel, but will help reach uh, climate change, air pollution goals, and we have, I've only touched upon a few of these, 
there are a, a lot more that can be discussed, that can be quantified. To me, the important thing is not just quantifying them and discussing them. It's really thinking clearly about what might create alliances across sectors so that the physical activity community actually works with the air pollution and the climate change or biodiversity community because we can work together and we, once we see how all of these uh, types of urban transitions work together towards the same goal, we can create alliances and push much, much uh, further for these uh, types of solutions. But it's not only talking to stakeholders and creating alliances there, but it's a lot about engaging the public, understanding what are their, the, what motivates members of the public, what are their hooks, how you can engage them in the policy process. So uh, I think thinking through these relationships is absolutely uh, necessary, needed uh, for our future. So I hope that you will join me in, 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 in making the case for these systems approach, for those holistic thinking across the different types of public health outcomes and challenges that we need to deal with today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Audrey, for this very interesting talk. We have time for several questions now. Is it on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, Diane Crow in Cardiff Metropolitan University in the UK. Thank you ever so much. That was just really refreshing to see and such wonderful um, pictures of urban environments, whether they're real or, or not. Um, yesterday, uh, we had a really uh, refreshing talk about citizen science. I just wondered whether, you know, engage, you talked about, you know, the need to engage the public. I just wondered if you'd use some of the, any of those techniques yet in, in your own work. Yeah, completely. I mean, that's, that's uh, in fact, that's what I was mentioning. I think that was really nice to see that citizen engagement. Absolutely, that's the way to, to, to go forward, I think. Um, in fact, this, this slide that I was just about to show and decided not to because I didn't want to have a long talk is some work that I'm doing in, uh, and I, 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 it's something that I want to talk to many of you about. And I've also some work that I'm doing, in fact, here with uh, our colleagues at Nice, developing uh, uh, approaches to engage uh, members of the public through, uh, through apps. Now, there are lots of downsides of, of creating active travel apps, but to me, the, the essential bit of an active travel app is, um, and uh, this is work I'm doing with Anne and with, uh, with John, her PhD student who's here somewhere, uh, and, and that I'm also doing at Imperial with other students, is trying to think about not only uh, apps, tra active travel apps, journey planner apps that provide some information on, on your physical activity, on your on your uh, air pollution contribution, et cetera. But it's also about seeing how we can use these to engage people, to be able to voice their concerns, to be able to pro voice their, their, their support. So having, which is needed anyway from an engagement perspective, if you just tell people you need to do this, this, and that to be healthy, of course, they're gonna be disengaged as we've seen uh, many times before and as, as, as was mentioned also with, uh, by Abby yesterday. So providing them an outlet, a way out by saying, uh, okay, perhaps you, you don't feel like you have the, the right environment to be uh, walking and cycling, but here's what you can do. Write to your elected official. Take a picture of this junction that just doesn't work for you. And, and so engage, so provide those options so that there's always something that somebody can do when they use their, their, uh, their journey planner app, for example. So that's something that I'm, that I'm currently working on and I think there's potential. And I, I, I loved seeing uh, Abby's work yesterday and I think maybe there's a way of, of combining these, uh, these efforts for sure. Yes, you're completely right. Thank you. Um, hi, Lisa Trelle from, uh, from the Netherlands, and I'm wondering how much uh, do you work do you do on the substitution, substitution of uh, normal biking, regular biking by e-biking? Because in the Netherlands, what we see, the for example, the number of car deaths or the traffic uh, deaths are decreasing, except for one group of the older e-bikers. We see it increasing, and what's worrying me even more is that uh, even younger children which uh, used to cycle to, to, to school up to 15, 20 kilometers, uh, kilometers each one way, 
and they now all have an e-bike, even if it's only three kilometers. So they get lazy. That worries me yeah, a lot. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Great question. So I, I did a bit of work in substitution in terms of actually who starts cycling, uh, and are there people who are already physically active? So just talking about normal cyclists, and 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 the evidence was that. Uh, uh, from the work that, that I did previously in some of the literature that people who do uh, start cycling tend to do that on top of regular physical activity. So in general, there's, there seems to be no substitution, which is great. In terms of e-biking, so the early evidence that we, 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 uh, we uncovered uh, in particular through the PASTA project is that the people who were uh, using el electric uh, bikes or, or pedelecs were receiving just as much physical activity as the others because they were going f much further distances. So the overall, the physical activity levels of people who use the e-bikes were just the same. Were the same. But I haven't looked at the substitution, and I bet there are people in this room <laughs> who have. So I'm hoping that somebody else will have an answer. But w I do know, just from the, at least a static point of view, that that because of the much longer trips, um, uh, the physical activity levels tends to be the same as as the the n regular cycling. But of course, as we embrace a lot more uh, e-biking, it might that that might have changed. So that was m from earlier research. There might and, and, and maybe some uh, people in the room would be would be more up to date on on that research. Anybody want to answer that? No. <laughs> no. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah. Over there. But thank you for that question. Sorry, it's another question. It's not an answer to that. It's a comment and a question. <laughs> so one, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Catherine Woods, University of Limerick. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think you raise a really important call to action to the HEPA members to look at the makeup of our scientific teams because you referred to data visualization, but also the use of pictures for data. And I think, you know, how many data visualization experts do we have in the HEPA network? And I think we really need to consider that. My question is, if you could give us an overview of the team of scientists you have around you, you know, the, the multidisciplinary expertise that you believe is necessary to really deliver messages of this nature in a translational way that will impact on policy? Yeah, th th you're completely right. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. So I think it's, it is absolutely necessary, uh, of course, to, to think about much broader types of uh, collaborations so that we think about those, uh, those types of, uh, of engagement processes. Uh, I think part of it is, is actually doing a lot more co-creation. So it's not just having experts, but it's actually working with people. I mean, ideally, you would have people like like artists who are uh, ha have an ability to. Th we know that uh, raising emotions is a way to engage people, just appealing to their feelings. So having artists that are part of the team is is really uh, helpful. But then, of course, uh, uh, psychologists, social scientists. I mean, but but more and more, uh, other than just bringing in experts, I think it's. Uh, having this co-creation approach so that we're working, and again, uh, something that Abby uh, talked about yesterday, so that we're generating this evidence with people who are also gonna be the, 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 the users and the benefactors. So that, uh, that will help. Uh, personally, uh, I work a lot with, uh, with lots of s specific disciplines of, uh, of people who are in environmental sciences, people who are in transportation behavior, um, e economists, uh, but more, again, more and more with this co-creation approach, which I think is needed. Thank you. Hi, Audrey. Uh, Hi, Zhang from uh, University Zhang, of Cutlisbury. Zhang is the person who's doing her PhD on this uh, app development. <laughs> yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to the uh, e-bike uh, topic. Um, so I know that there's, in the cycling world, there is a divide between people who cycle without electric and with electric. and the people who don't use electric doesn't think that electric is a good idea. And, but we do know that it does um, get people off their cars and onto bikes. And there are a lot of uh, interventions that we see already that if you provide an uh, e-bike, it's easier to get people out of their cars. But at the same time, so I'm a pretty new uh, cyclist myself since I started. I 
move to um, active transport. And um, I'm just, I'm seeing all these bike bikers with electric bikes and they're going really fast. And what do you think about if, if we're changing these car drivers into e-bikers and if we're gonna create a cycleway that's actually more dangerous? That's, that's one of my, yeah. uh, what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, you're completely right. And, and you touch upon something that's absolutely essential is that, uh, so some of us tend to be uh, uh, hard cyclists and, and a bit uh, ayatollahs of cycling and, and reject anything that's not a conventional bike. I tend to be a bit that way, like, ah, those e-bikes, they're a nuisance. But, um, but as you say, they can get people out of their cars. And if we can't get people out of their cars, uh, onto cycling with uh, conventional cyclists, and I think that's something that we could be embracing. But we need to have the infrastructure to go with it. Now, of course, the good, good thing is uh, an e-bike takes a lot less space than, an, than a normal car, which means that if we uh, promote a big shift uh, outside, out of cars and, and towards whether it's e-bike or, or conventional bikes, then there'll be a lot more space. Then we can create infrastructure that allows that space for both e-bikes and, and, uh, and conventional bikes. So I don't think that should be something that should necessarily put people uh, off um, promotion of, of e-bikes. But it looks like Nanette has uh, a, a comment on this, which is probably far more intelligent than mine. <laughs> uh, if there's a, a mic, a last question or comments, maybe an answer to this. <laughs> I thought I could project, maybe, but uh, Thank you so much for the thought-provoking presentation. And the one comment I want to add is we haven't discussed the e-scooters. Now, they should have a danger health warning inactive travel across them. But yet, people are standing, they're not in their cars. But they are dangerous, I've noticed here in Nice and Barcelona. Other cities have now made laws against them. You can't be on the pavement, you can't be on the road. You can't have it. So have you got a view or any data on the e-scooter? Yeah, I mean, I don't have sadly any, any data on it. Uh, I've got views on anything, everything, sadly. Um, but I think that, again, we, we, we can't really go against these things. I mean, <laughs> there's, that's the way, the, the way we're going. And so we need to think about making it work rather than uh, so London, uh, for a long time, made it uh, illegal to ride a, a, a scooter, an e-scooter. Well, it's not. It, that's not going to hold for very long because there's. Uh, that's that's. Those are the trends. So we need to embrace the fact that there are potential uh, ways of getting people out of cars. That's that's a benefit. Uh, but then creating the infrastructure so that it's it's safe for everyone. Uh, so again, having that systems thinking, not just dealing with one problem at a time. But if we create that shift so that. Our, our streets are entirely different and, cr and have the space for all modes of travel and not just for cars, then, then it's not as much of a problem. The reason it's a problem is that we've got lots of cars in our street. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, o Audrey. We are our and we will have five minutes of active pause with Stacy. Thank you. Okay, guys, we're going to get up again. This time we'll be a little more active because we'll go into a coffee break. So we've got the music up. Give yourselves a little bit of space. You can move into the aisles, move up front so we can get moving just a little bit. So we're going to start same side elbow to the knee. So we're going here to here. A little bit of balance. Try not to hit the person next to you if you need to move. Plenty of space up here. That's three, four. Let's go to the other side now. Here. And you're just kind of pulling it in, like you're grabbing something from the ceiling and pulling it down into your knee. That's four, five. Now let's go opposite. So we're going to go left hand to the right knee. Little bit of twist, a little bit of rotation. Make sure to keep your stomach tight. Draw the belly button in towards the backbone. That's three and four. One more here, five. Switch sides. That's one, two. Heart rates are getting up a little bit. Last one here. All right, now we're gonna reach to the side here. 
and then opposite side. Again, a little bit of twist. We're gonna go five to each side. So that was three. And we've got two more. Good, last one here. And now we're gonna rotate the same, but reach up and bring the toe. So the whole body kind of rotates just a little bit. There we go. Two more here. That's one. Nice. And two. All right. Feet together. We're going to step out with a small squat down. Step in. Now to the outside. There we go. So out, in, out, in. Good. That was two. We're just doing five, guys. You just want to kind of get the heart rate up a little bit. Get the joints moving before we have some coffee. Nice. Very good. Now we're gonna do a lateral lunge, stepping to the side. We're gonna keep one leg straight, the other knee bent. Tap the toe and bring it back in. Tap the toe, bring it back in. All to one side now. Very good, two more. That's one, good. And last one here, switch to the other side. There we go. Everybody in the same direction so we're not lunging onto each other. Two more here, that's one. Very good, and last one, good. Now you're gonna grab the front of your seat and you're gonna squat down. Touch your bottom to the seat and then back up. It's kind of a simple squat. There we go. Let's do two more here. Good. We're gonna keep with the same thing. This time when we come up, up onto the toes. So a little bit of squat into a toe raise. Good. And that's four. Last one here. Very good. Now you're gonna go to the side. So I want you to face the side, lunge forward, and then back up. Most important here, try to keep the knee off the ground. So we wanna keep at least an inch off the ground, about five centimeters. Really protect the patella so we're not tapping. That's four, good, and five. Together to the other side now. Everybody face that direction. There we go. Just a little muscular reinforcement. And four, good. And five. Nice job, guys. Bring the arms up. Breathe really deep in. And then bring it back down. I know we all want coffee, so wake back up. And then down. Nice, breathe in nice and deep. Hold for one, two, and back down. And last one. Nice job. Give yourselves a hand. Little pause. The doors are open, and we invite you guys to have some coffee, some water. Bring your heart rate down. <laughs>